arrested, Mr. President, within 24, 48, 72 hours, you could have hundreds and hundreds of resignations of the leadership of your entire Justice Department because of your actions. What's that going to say about you? I think at that point, Pat Cipollone said, yeah, this is a murder-suicide pact, this letter. New shocking revelations about an extraordinary meeting where top Justice Department officials stood up to President Trump. We're also learning in the January 6th committee hearings of several Republican members of Congress requesting pardons for their role in former President Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court limits state and local governments from restricting guns outside the home. ABC's Terry Moran and Rachel Scott have the latest on the far-reaching decision. ABC's Devin Dwyer looks at how the ruling will change gun laws in states that are home to a quarter of all Americans, where more people will be able to apply for permits to carry concealed firearms. Local officials are worried about what it all means. The types of disputes that would be settled by people yelling at each other, maybe engaging in a fist fight, are being settled with guns. Even people who are well trained, uh, who are, you know, who are prepared and, and carry a gun oftentimes have to make split-second decisions that they then regret. 50 years later, we look at how Title IX has leveled the playing field and how the president is hoping to expand the law's protection by the numbers. And our weekly look at TikTok, we meet Mamadou Jai, who's captivated millions with videos on the wild world of deadly animals and what you should do when you come face-to-face -face with one. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us tonight. We are following that blockbuster Supreme Court ruling expanding gun rights in America at the very same time that Congress tries to push gun reform for the first time in decades. But we do begin with the explosive new revelations from the January 6th hearing about the relentless pressure campaign by President Trump insisting the DOJ find fraud in the election so that he could stay in power. We learned that in a Sunday meeting in the Oval Office just three days before January 6th, the former president called top officials to tell them he planned to replace the acting attorney general with someone who would go along with his scheme. According to testimony today, every top official in the department told them he would re that they would resign if he did. They also also said there might be hundreds of resignations at the DOJ. We also learned more about a phone call days before that between Trump and acting AG Jeff Rosen, Jeff Rosen, where the president reportedly told him to just say the election was corrupt and quote, leave the rest to me. And there was a revelation about members of Congress asking for pardons. We'll have those names for you in just a moment. But first, our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl, leads us off with just how close this country teetered toward a constitutional crisis in the days surrounding January 6th. Tonight, top officials in the Trump Justice Department described the immense pressure Donald Trump put on them to use the power of their department to help overturn the presidential election. After Attorney General Bill Barr, who had told Trump there was no election fraud, resigned in late December 2020, Trump put pressure on his replacement, Jeffrey Rosen, to do what Barr had refused to do. So between December 23rd and January 3rd, the president either called me or met with me virtually every day, with one or two exceptions like Christmas Day. Trump relentlessly pushed Rosen and his deputy Richard Donahue. The uh, president's entreaties became more urgent. He became more adamant that we weren't doing our job. We need to step up and do our job. Um, and he had this arsenal of allegations um, that he wanted to, um, to rely on. I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false. That is not true. Rosen at one point told President Trump, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. How did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, essentially, uh, that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. The rise and fall of A number United of Republican States congressmen were actively Lord promoting the president's Lord. lies. One of them, Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, pointed Trump to an obscure official in the Justice Department, Jeffrey Clark, who ran the department's environmental division. Clark drafted a letter for the Justice Department to send to the state of Georgia. This letter claims that the U.S. Department of Justice's investigations have, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. It was patently false, and the top lawyers at DOJ rejected it out of hand. It was so extreme to me, I had a hard time getting my head around it initially. I thought it was 
very important to give a prompt response rejecting this out of hand. January 3rd, Acting Attorney General Rosen found himself in the Oval Office with Clark, the President, and top DOJ lawyers. Jeff Clark was proposing that uh, Jeff Rosen be replaced by Jeff Clark. And I thought the proposal was asinine. Witnesses say Clark told Trump that if he were in charge of the Justice Department, he would do what the president was demanding and find real voter fraud. And so I said, Mr. President, you're talking about putting a man in that seat who has never tried a criminal case, who's never conducted a criminal investigation. It's impossible. It's absurd. It's not going to happen and it's going to fail. Trump then asked this question. He said, so suppose I do this. So suppose I replace him. Jeff Rosen with him, Jeff Clark, what would you do? And I said, Mr. President, we resign immediately. I'm not working one minute for this guy. You're gonna lose your entire department leadership. Every single AAG will walk out on you. And Jeff Clark will be left leading a graveyard. Ultimately, the threat of mass resignations worked. The president decided not to name Jeff Clark the acting attorney general. Trump's pressure campaign on the Justice Department did not let up. After the horror of January 6th, a number of Republican members of Congress who had been pushing Trump's lies. There's widespread evidence of fraud. We are going to object to electors from states that didn't run clean elections. Asked the White House for pardons. And was Representative Gates requesting a pardon? Believe so. The, the general tone was, we may get prosecuted because we were defensive of, you know, the president's positions on these things. The pardon that he was discussing, requesting, was as broad as you could describe. From the beginning, I remember he's from the beginning of time up until today, for any and all things. He mentioned Nixon, and I said Nixon's pardon was never nearly that broad. Jonathan Carl joins us now from the Capitol. John, the Justice Department is now doing its own investigation of the events surrounding January 6th, and you're learning that yesterday federal agents raided the home of Jeffrey Clark. Uh, they did. They raided his home on Wednesday, Lindsay, and this is a clear sign that that Justice Department investigation has gone beyond those who physically attacked the Capitol building on January 6th to people closer to Trump's inner circle. Jeffrey Clark, by the way, did give a deposition to this January 6th committee, a taped deposition, but he refused to answer their questions, repeatedly invoking his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. And we heard today about a conspiracy theory claiming that an Italian satellite changed votes. I explain yeah, that one to I us. Mean, I mean, I'll try. This, is, <laughs> this was just nuts. Uh, the, uh, the officials testified that the White House was repeatedly trying to get them uh, to investigate this theory that an Italian military s satellite was used to change votes from Trump to Biden and those Dominion voting machines, and that somehow somebody at the U.S. Embassy in Rome was involved. Well, the, the chief of staff at the White House, uh, we heard today, was actually uh, calling over to the Justice Department, asking for this to be investigated. At one point, uh, the Department of Defense was brought into this and asked to uh, uh, to look into it as well. Really amazing, because the theory, as, uh, was te as uh, officials testified today, was simply nuts. <laughs> Nuts, right? It's right up there with the dog ate my homework. All right, Jonathan Carl, our, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Let's bring in congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. And Rachel, I want to talk about that other stunning news that we learned during the hearing, and that was the number of Republican lawmakers who allegedly asked for pardons after repeating Trump's false claims. It bears mentioning that the allegations came from people who were testifying under oath. What did we learn? Trump White House officials testifying under oath that at least five Republican members of Congress asked for presidential pardons. And I want to read you this list. On here, Republican Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama, who sent an email to the White House asking for pardons not only for himself, but for the 147 Republicans in the House who voted against certifying the 2020 election. The special assistant to the president also testified that Representative Matt Gates of Florida was personally pushing for a blanket pardon since early December. Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona also sought a pardon, according to witnesses, as well as Louie Gobert of Texas and Scott Perry of Pennsylvania. At least five total, Lindsay. 
And, and some of the accused are pushing back tonight on those claims that they asked for a pardon. Tell us about that. Exactly. Tonight, we are hearing from some of the Republicans responding to these allegations. On that list, so we're hearing from Republican Representative Scott Perry. Now, he, his office tells me that this is a ludicrous, soulless lie. He's flat out denying this. But Republican Congressman Mo Brooks isn't denying it at all. He says the pardons were actually unnecessary after all. Marjorie Taylor Greene was also sort of mentioned about discussing possible pardons. She's pushing back very strongly tonight as well. But the words from Republican Congressman Adam Adam Kinzinger standing out saying you would not think to ask for a pardon unless you thought you committed a crime, Lindsay. And the select committee is saying that they have evidence in, in many of these cases. Mm -hmm. Rachel Scott reporting from the Capitol for us. Thanks so much, Rachel. For more analysis of today's hearings, let's bring in Khan Nowadea, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Thanks once again for joining us, Khan. So in the earlier hearings, we really saw the committee uh, lean heavily on the tape testimony from former Attorney General Bill Barr in order to really establish uh, that Trump was aware that his um, allegations of fraud uh, were false. How do you feel that the, the, the committee did with regard to shifting the focus today uh, to talk about Trump then pressuring uh, the Department of Justice? I, I think it was a seamless transition. Uh, you're absolutely right. We started with Barr uh, earlier testifying about how he told uh, Trump that all these allegations were false. And now we have the pressure campaign. And I think uh, the DOJ, former DOJ officials, really went in great detail and set forth methodically how they were pressured at every step to do something that was false and, and to do something based on false premises. And we also heard from a witness today who detailed a phone call in December, and I want to quote him where he said that the president uh, just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me. How strong do you feel that the case was made today, again, implicating uh, the former president directly in trying to subvert the, the results of the election? That is a vital piece of evidence that is so telling. Right? Because essentially you have the President of the United States telling the top cop in the United States, just make it up. Just make it up. I'll, I'll take care of the rest. Just say the lie. And based on that lie, I'll take care of it. And it's, it's to, in my mind, a devastating piece of evidence. Anything surprise you today or, or fall shorter or flat, flatter than you thought? I think the surprising thing is what happened outside of the hearings that we heard about from yesterday with respect to the search warrant on kind of the, the main person of interest during the hearings, Jeffrey Clark. Um, it, it's What I've been trying to follow is who are the other co-conspirators, right? We had a previous hearing where clearly it was Eastman is a co-conspirator. Today, it's Jeffrey Clark. And lo and behold, DOJ executes a search warrant on Jeffrey Clark's home yesterday. And what do we think that they might have been looking for inside his home? Um, when somebody uh, obtains a search warrant uh, on a piece of property, uh, a judge has to decide there's probable cause to believe that there's been a crime committed and there's going to be evidence of a crime there. We don't know what crime it is, but we do know those two things, that a judge has determined there may be evidence of crime at Jeffrey uh, Cohen's home. And so what's interesting here is that, at uh, Clark's home, right? Oh, uh, yes, Jeffrey yeah. Clark's home, uh, right. Uh, I mean, it, it, what's interesting here is that with regard to the hearings, they were expected to continue next week, but now they've delayed them until mid-July because they say that they're actually getting new information and that they need to investigate. How significant is that? I think that is so significant, and this is the reason. I, I think when we all started with these hearings, we thought, okay, they've got all their evidence, now they're ready. But actually, it's been proceeding like a grand jury investigation, an active grand jury investigation, where in real time, they're getting new evidence. And remember, Lindsay, they put up a tip line saying, hey, if you have any evidence, come to us. And guess what? It looks like people have been coming to them. And your reaction with regard to the officials saying that they would have stepped down if Trump would have uh, replaced the, the acting attorney general? I, I thought that was heroic. Um, I, I thought today's testimony was so sobering about how close we came to uh, basically the institution of the DOJ being gutted and its credibility being gutted. And but for the conduct of those former DOJ officials, we would have been in a bad spot. Con nowadays. Appreciate your insight as always.
Now back to the Supreme Court ruling that could dramatically expand gun rights in America and alter existing laws on the books in states where one in four Americans live. The six to three decision striking down New York State's 110 year old law that required gun owners to show a heightened need and a proper cause in order to carry a concealed handgun in public for self defense. In that majority opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas wrote citizens shouldn't have to explain to the government why they are seeking to exercise a constitutional right. But the ruling does allow states to ban guns in, quote, sensitive places like schools, government buildings, and courthouses. But that language is raising many questions tonight. What about crowded areas like Times Square or the subways underground or packed sporting events like a baseball game at Yankee Stadium? And what does this mean for where you live and what happens next? Our Terry Moran reports. For more than a century, New York State has had one of the nation's strictest laws regulating the concealed carrying of firearms. But today, the Supreme Court struck that law down. The New York law required anyone seeking a license to carry a concealed handgun to show they had proper cause, a special need for it. But by a 6-3 to three majority, the court today declared that law violates the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Justice Clarence Thomas writing for the court, we know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to government officers some special need. It is not how the Second Amendment works when it comes to public carry for self-defense. The New York law Thomas wrote for the court's six conservative justices gave local officials too much discretion over a constitutional right. Why isn't it good enough to say I live in a violent area and um, I want to be able to defend myself? Now New York must revise the 109-year-old law in accordance, Thomas wrote, with this nation's historical traditions of firearms regulation. Today, the governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, swift in her reaction. This decision isn't just reckless, it's reprehensible. It's not what New Yorkers want. And we should have the right of determination of what we want to do in terms of our gun laws in our state. President Biden, in a statement, said the ruling should deeply trouble us all, adding, in the wake of the horrific attacks in Buffalo and Uvalde, we must do more as a society, not less, to protect our fellow Americans. I think it's a bad decision. I think it's, and I think it's not reasoned accurately, but I'm disappointed. In his dissent, Justice Stephen Breyer mentioned the nearly 300 mass shootings that have occurred this year, saying the court's decision does not consider the potentially deadly consequences and that it burdens states' efforts in preventing gun violence and protecting the safety of its citizens. But Justice Samuel Alito firing back, writing, how does the dissent account for the fact that one of the mass shootings near the top of its list took place in Buffalo? The New York law at issue in this case obviously did not stop that perpetrator. The head of a gun rights group that brought the case saying he's relieved. We are not the problem. The problem is the criminals and the wrongdoers in the state. And the politicians have to learn that. The decision is also being hailed as a landmark win for the NRA. 80 million Americans live in states with laws similar to New York's, and it remains to be seen how those laws might change. Under this opinion, those laws are also likely unconstitutional. And so all of those states are now going to have to go back to the drawing board and pass new laws, you know, regulating the ability to carry guns outside of the home. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, New York City's mayor today said that this is a nightmare scenario for them if people can carry guns into the subways and other crowded areas. So what changes with this ruling and, and how many states could be impacted? Well, this is going to have a huge nationwide impact, Lindsay. There are eight states, by our count, that have laws very similar to New York's, and, and those laws now will fall under this ruling as soon as they're challenged. But it has a broader impact because under this ruling by Justice Thomas, every American has a presumptive, fundamental constitutional right to carry a gun for self-defense in public. Uh, the court did leave the door open for government regulation of firearms in what they call sensitive spaces, the government buildings, polling places, maybe public transportation like the subway, and private establishment like restaurants, taverns, churches, they're exempt. But the bottom line in this landmark uh, decision for gun rights is that there will be many more Americans carrying many more guns in public. Lindsay? All right, Terry Moran for us. Thanks so much, Terry. 
Joining us now for more on the Supreme Court ruling and what could be the first gun legislation in Congress in three decades is California Democratic Senator Alex Padilla. Senator, thank you so much for your time tonight. First off, California is America's most populous state. You were born in Los Angeles, which is, of course, one of the largest cities in the country. You've said that this ruling will make communities less safe. What concerns you most about the impact of the ruling on, on large cities like Los Angeles? Uh, well, look, first of all, I think the Supreme Court ruling uh, is uh, uh, misinterpreting the Constitution and will absolutely make our communities less safe. Uh, we've seen, particularly in states like California, that smart, the common sense gun safety laws uh, make a difference by saving lives. The statistics do not lie. Uh, the uh, the rates at which you see uh, mass shooting incidents, for example, and the number of people in California who die as a result of gun violence is significantly less than states that have much looser uh, laws and restrictions when it comes to gun ownership uh, and gun purchasing. So I think this uh, Supreme Court ruling, uh, really the extreme majority on the Supreme Court of uh, issuing this ruling uh, threatens a lot of the gun safety measures in not just states like uh, the state of California, but other states around the country. And that's why. And, and particularly shocking on a day that the United States Senate is on the verge of taking the first significant action to improve gun safety in nearly three decades. California has one of the most restrictive concealed carry permitting rules in the country. And while this ruling does not erase that just overnight, are, are there areas that the state is already looking to shore up the permitting process while still trying to be in compliance with the court ruling? Uh, absolutely, because we take it so seriously. Uh, Governor Newsom has been a national leader on this. Our Attorney General, Rob Bonta, just today, and I'll read from his uh, statement, uh, is already working with the legislature to clarify where concealed firearms are forbidden and enumerate the qualifications required for obtaining a concealed carry permit. So what you said is a very important for the people watching in California. The existing laws are still on the books and will still be enforced. Uh, but in anticipation of a potential legal challenge to the current law, the legislature will act quickly uh, to uh, uh, make sure that uh, California laws will uh, stand up to that test. And uh, despite the Supreme Supreme Court uh, ruling uh, will continue to be in place in California. A lot of conversation right now, which you just touched about on, is that that language in, in the ruling that allows for handguns not to be carried in, quote, sensitive places. Does the court need to be more specific as to what those places are? For example, we know guns are not allowed in schools, courthouses, and other government buildings. But what about Dodger Stadium, for example? <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm sure that those conversations took place behind the scenes among the Supreme Court justices, and they did not. And so, uh, once again, leaving it to uh, the common sense of the California legislature and the governor uh, and many city officials around uh, the state of California to make those determinations. Uh, it is common sense. That's why the smarter gun safety measures uh, is so uh, popular amongst the American people, regardless of political party. There's broad support for, you know, where guns, uh, not just assault weapons, but even uh, handguns should not be allowed. Uh, we know uh, schools, no brainer on that, uh, but large uh, public venues, uh, that, that, that uh, is more than uh, logical, more than common sense. And you touched on this too, but I just want to go one step further. You know, tonight some people are saying that it's one step forward and, and several steps backward as, as you and your colleagues in the Senate are working on the first federal gun legislation in decades. It could be on the president's desk before the end of the week. Does this Supreme Court decision kind of take the wind out of the sails of this gun reform uh, set to pass Congress? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think it takes the, the, the wind out of the sails. I mean, don't get me started on the Supreme Court. We've seen what they've done to voting rights. We know what they're on the verge of doing when it comes to reproductive rights uh, in uh, uh, illogical, wrong in my opinion, ruling today on uh, uh, concealed weapons. All the more reason why Congress hmm. needs to continue to do its job. The United States Senate, despite the challenges of the filibuster, despite the 50-50 the split in the Senate, uh, is on the verge of historic action tonight uh, to improve gun safety through enhanced background checks for gun buyers under the age of 21, closing the boyfriend loophole to better protect uh, victims of domestic violence or others uh, at risk from uh, violent abusers, uh, and funding, significant funding for 
mental health services throughout the country. Uh, this measure will save lives. And as soon as this is done, uh, I know I'm going to continue the fight. So many of us will continue the fight to ultimately ban assault weapons uh, on the streets of America, large capacity magazines and more. A recent polling on this issue from Gallup found that two in three Americans want laws covering the sales of firearms to be stricter. Uh, a recent poll also found that six in ten Americans think that abortion should be legal in most or all cases. But as we know, the court is poised to rule on Roe v. Wade as soon as tomorrow. Do you feel at all that the court has lost touch with the, the average views of Americans? And, and if so, is there anything that can be done about it? Look, I, I do certainly think that uh, there is a disconnect uh, for anybody who's concerned about the uh, uh, public confidence in the federal judiciary, not just the Supreme Court. We have to acknowledge how the, the federal judiciary was stacked under the previous administration and why, uh, as a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I've been working with my colleagues and President Biden uh, to identify and nominate and confirm uh, better perspectives to uh, the federal bench. Uh, uh, not just uh, the incoming, uh, soon to be Justice Kataji Brown Jackson at the Supreme Court, but at circuit courts across America, district courts across America. Uh, representation matters, not just uh, in the executive branch, not just in the legislative branch, but on the judiciary, clearly. Senator Padilla, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, Lindsay. And when we come back, their dramatic backstory to this stunning pool rescue that took place during a swimming event. The major safety concerns tonight after two planes hit each other, but one was allowed to take off for Italy. But up next, our Devin Dwyer talks to the Second Amendment advocates cheering today's Supreme Court ruling on guns and a big city mayor concerned about the ripple effects. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money, that's how we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free.
This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. A father was ordered to serve seven days in jail for this. He lunged and repeatedly punched the man accused of murdering his, th his three-year-old son. Officers in Ohio finally got control of Antonio Hughes, but it took them four people to contain his rage before he was taken out of the courtroom. He was charged with contempt of court. The suspect is facing two murder charges and is accused of not only killing a toddler, but dumping him into a river while still alive, and also the boy's mother. The young child's body so far has not been recovered. To bid today's Supreme Court ruling on guns could have far-reaching implications for the right to carry in states across this country. So our Devin Dwyer spoke to the advocates who brought the case and are cheering today's ruling as well as those concerned about the potential fallout. The decision is a win for gun owners like Cheryl Apple. A mother of five and small business owner we met in upstate New York and who told us she needs a loaded concealed handgun in public for her safety. The uptick in violence has just been astronomical. Um, the gun violence. I just felt that I needed to be able to protect myself. Self-protection was at the heart of the Supreme Court's decision today and on the minds of thousands of gun-owning Americans who want their weapons close at hand. Apple was approved for a license under New York's concealed carry law, but it wasn't easy to get. The Second Amendment does not end at your doorstep. Tom King, president of New York State so Rifle and Pistol Association, brought the Supreme Court uh, case, yes, hoping to take down the state's requirement of a proper cause to carry a gun. Proper cause is a restriction. It's, it's something that the anti-gunners put in there to keep the guns out of the hands of lawful, uh, lawful citizens in New York State. Today, King telling ABC News his group's 27,000 gun owners, many of whom were denied concealed carry permits, are ecstatic. I've been hearing from uh, California, New Jersey, and other states, people calling up and saying thank you because it's ultimately going to affect us here. And, uh, I, you know, it was such a breath of fresh air for the, for the Second Amendment people. The ripple effects will reach far beyond New York. Eight other states, home to around 80 million Americans, have similar concealed carry rules that now all could be rolled back. That requirement for showing a heightened need for self-defense, that was the teeth of these permitting laws. We can expect in the future that more people will be carrying handguns on the streets in places like Los Angeles, Boston, and New York City because of this decision today. And that most concerns people like Albany, New York Mayor Kathy Sheehan, who fears more guns, even in the hands of licensed and trained citizens, will mean a tinderbox on her streets. The types of disputes that would be settled by people yelling at each other, maybe engaging in a fist fight, are being settled with guns. Even people who are well trained, uh, who are, you know, who are prepared and, and carry a gun, oftentimes have to make split sec second decisions that they then regret. It's ludicrous. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. We are the lawful, legal citizens of the state. You know, most of us have training and, and we're not going to start a gun battle over the argument over an argument for a parking spot. Okay, it just that doesn't happen. Many states have dropped licensing requirements altogether in recent years. 25 states allow gun owners to carry a concealed weapon without a permit. But Justice Brett Kavanaugh today making clear that states can still require them, writing the court's decision does not prohibit states from imposing licensing requirements for carrying a handgun for self-defense. The court also left untouched restrictions on where guns are carried, sensitive places like subways or sports stadiums, even if people have permits. That sensitive places doctrine was not at issue in this case and still exists. And one of the things I would expect to see in the, the coming months and years is a lot of focus on whether or not enough places are deemed sensitive right now. Do we really want a whole bunch of Cheryl's running around with pistols in the grocery store? And yeah, the we, we probably do because Cheryl is trained. I feel proficient with my weapon. I feel secure with my weapon and I feel confident with my weapon. I don't think the Cheryl's are the one out there that are hurting people and committing the crimes and being unsafe with their guns. You ever worry you might make a mistake? Accidentally shoot somebody or shoot the wrong person? No, no I don't. I, I would have before I took this class, but now I don't, not at all. 
a vote of confidence for concealed carry. As tonight, American gun owners celebrate a landmark victory at the Supreme Court. A lot of mixed reaction there, thanks to Devin Dwyer. Still ahead here on Prime, the FDA orders all Juul products off the shelves in the U.S. We have the details. The U.S. okays hundreds of millions of dollars worth of weapons for Ukraine, the latest on that conflict. And it's been 50 years since the landmark Title IX legislation. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the next generation Manning superstar, the nephew of Peyton and Eli Arch Manning announces he just committed to play for the University of Texas. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you could be putting your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back, everyone. Today marks 50 years since Title IX took effect. It was part of the wider education amendments of 1972 and bars discrimination based on sex and education programs or activities that receive federal financial assistance. Its main impact has been on sports. Let's take a look at half a century of Title IX by the numbers. In 1972, women's sports accounted for only 2% of athletic budgets, according to The Athletic. Roughly 300,000 girls played high school sports, and just 15% of NCAA athletes were women, according to Axios. Today, 3.4 million girls play high school sports and 44% of NCAA athletes are women. Title IX helped create a pipeline for elite women athletes to compete on the world stage. 66, that's how many medals U.S. women won at the 2021 Tokyo Olympics, according to USA Today. Out of a total 113 for Team USA, that means women won nearly 60% of all U.S. Olympic medals at the Games. 50 years on some of the limits of Title IX are becoming clear. 19 states have banned or restricted transgender youth from participating in sports, according to the AP. On Thursday, to mark the 50th anniversary, the Biden administration proposed new changes for Title IX that would bar discrimination against transgender students. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Brad Pitt gets candid about his long road to sobriety. And the TikToker who's warning us all about the animals we need to know could actually kill us. We are being serious about that. But first, look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com.
at stake in our world right now. We wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. A stunning legal defeat for gun control advocates in the state of New York. The Supreme Court justices expanding gun rights in a 6-3 decision, striking down New York's concealed carry law. The court's ruling stems from a legal challenge brought by a group of New York gun owners who argued the state's concealed carry law violates U.S. Constitution. The statute only allows those who show proper cause or a specific special need to carry a firearm in public places. The court's decision comes amid a surge in gun violence across the country and follows the recent mass shootings in Buffalo, New York and Uvalde, Texas, which has triggered historic congressional action on gun safety. Top officials in the Trump Justice Department described the immense pressure Donald Trump put on them to use the power of their department to help overturn the presidential election. After Attorney General Bill Barr, who had told Trump there was no election fraud, resigned in late December 2020, Trump put pressure on his replacement, Jeffrey Rosen, and his deputy, Richard Donahue. And he had this arsenal of allegations um, that he wanted to, um, to rely on. I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false. That is not true. Rosen at one point told President Trump, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. It was so extreme to me, I had a hard time getting my head around it initially. I thought it was very important to give a prompt response rejecting this out of hand. After the horror of January 6th, a number of Republican members of Congress who had been pushing Trump's lies. There's widespread evidence of fraud. We are going to object to electors from states that didn't run clean elections. Asked the White House for pardons. Jewel vape products are now banned from store shelves across the U.S. The FDA today ordered Jewel to pull its e-cigarettes and pods from stores. The decision comes nearly two years after Jewel submitted data to the FDA in hopes to stay in business. The FDA says a review found the company had insufficient and conflicting data regarding the toxicity and potentially harmful chemicals found in Jewel pods. FDA officials say Jewel's product line has contributed to a disproportionate role in the rise in youth vaping. 
happening. The European Union is expected to grant Ukraine candidate status, a symbolic move that sets a roadmap to full EU membership, while also sending a message to Russia. The decision at a two-day meeting in Brussels requires all 27 EU members to agree. It could take five years or more for Ukraine to align its laws and practices with the rest of the group. The move comes as the U.S. announced another $450 million in military aid to Ukraine, including more medium-range rocket systems. Ukraine's defense minister tweeting a thank you to the U.S., saying that the missiles, HIMARS, have arrived and that summer will be hot for Russian occupiers. In an exclusive interview and photo shoot with GQ magazine, Brad Pitt admitting that he spent a year and a half getting sober after Jolie filed for divorce six years ago, saying, I had a really cool men's group here that was really private and selective, so it was safe. Otessa Moshfeg sat down with the star in Los Angeles. He is a very deep thinker, and I think that um, his sobriety is, is part of an ongoing journey to understand himself in life. In 2020, Pitt credited Bradley Cooper with helping him quit drinking. Alone and for a long time, seemingly unsure of exactly who he was. Pitt telling GQ he suffered from a low-grade depression. Out here in California, there's a lot of talk about being your authentic self. It would plague me. What does authentic mean? For me, it was getting to a place of acknowledging those deep scars that we carry. Next to the troubling incident that we're learning about at New York's JFK airport, raising serious safety questions, an arriving Air France, France plane claimed that it was struck by a departing Alitalia plane, but air traffic controllers allowed the Alitalia plane to take off. Tonight, that Air France plane remains stuck on the JFK tarmac as investigators probe what went wrong. Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, we're learning of a collision between two commercial planes at New York's JFK airport. But what happened next, even more shocking. Listen, as an Air France pilot calls air traffic control to tell them his plane was just hit by an ITA jet, formerly known as Alitalia. Yes, this is Air France 008. We are on standard nine, and there is an Alitalia passing behind us that hit our aircraft. Uh, it's very dangerous for him uh, not to take off. Can you say this again, please? You're saying that the Alitalia aircraft hit you? The Air France pilot asking ATC to stop that plane from taking off because it may have wing damage. But incredibly, ATC clears the plane for takeoff with hundreds of passengers on board, calling the plane while it's already flying. Another uh, aircraft uh, on the ground currently, Air France, said that you hit them or something of that nature while you were taxiing. Did you uh, experience any uh, damage to the aircraft? Negative, sir. The captain never turns the plane around, flying all the way to Rome. He absolutely should have turned the airplane around, brought it back to JFK for inspection. And Lindsay, that Italian airline says it is investigating, but why was it allowed to take off? The FAA says it's looking into this incident. Lindsay? Gio, thank you. Paul Pelosi, the husband of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, was charged with two misdemeanor counts of driving under the influence. The Napa County District Attorney's Office announced the charges on Thursday. Paul Pelosi was involved in a crash over the Memorial Day weekend. His blood alcohol content, according to officials, was 0.082 percent. He's expected to appear in court in August. And next tonight to the heat wave that's spreading across the country. Of course, we know it's summer, but records nationwide are being broken. Let's bring in our senior meteorologist, Rob Marciano. Rob, talk to us about this heat and the strong storms that have been sweeping through the country. Well, the same story's been going on for like 10 days now, hasn't it, Lindsay? Well, today we nearly hit some all-time record highs in places like Mobile that got to 102 degrees. Remember, this is measured in the shade without humidity. Jacksonville also seeing a record high temperature. Uh, tomorrow, when you couple in the, the, uh, the heat index or the humidity, it begins to feel like 104 in New Orleans. There's a heat warning out there, 105 in Dallas. They've had that for nearly uh, two weeks. Now, another heat wave is building from California into the Pacific Northwest. And this is around the time of year last year when Portland had that deadly heat wave. Then they had temperatures 110, 115. By Saturday and Sunday, they will get close to 100 degrees. That's still dangerous heat for the Willamette Valley. And in the middle of the upper Midwest, we're talking about the severe threat tomorrow from Omaha through Sioux Falls, Sioux City, up through Fargo, and on either side of those rivers, we're looking at damaging winds, large hail, and isolated to uh, tornadoes through tomorrow afternoon. Lindsay? 
All right, Rob Marciano, thanks to you as always. Now to the breathtaking rescue. An American synchronized swimmer loses consciousness in the middle of a competition and then sinks to the bottom of the pool. TJ Holmes has more. New images of the terrifying moments for an American swimmer. Anita Alvarez competing in Budapest in artistic swimming. Lost consciousness and sank to the bottom of the pool. Overnight, GMA spoke exclusively to Alvarez's coach, Andrea Fuentes, who jumped in and saved her. Not our ability to breathe until I reached her um, underwater. You can see Fuentes dragging Alvarez to the surface where the swimmer initially wasn't breathing. Another swimmer who was preparing to compete jumped in and helped Fuentes pull Alvarez to the surface. I know the sport. When, when you finish a choreography, you really want to breathe because you hold your breath for a long time and the first thing you want to do is <gasps> breathe, no? And because you're done. And I saw that she was going down. So I was like, I immediately knew that something was happening. So I went as fast as I could. And then I reached her and brought her to the surface and tried to calm her down and, and make her breathe. Fuentes began administering CPR until medics and the team doctor were able to take over. The heart rate was fine, pressure was fine, oxygen, glucose, everything was good. So I knew she was okay. There's um, a way that you press very hard the nail and this creates, it's very painful but it creates adrenaline for you to wake up. So she woke up like, Wah! Artistic swimming often requires holding your breath for long periods of time. The sport is extremely hard. Sometimes people um, pass out, at least pass out, because our job is to discover our limits. No? That's, that's what we do as, as athletes. So glad they jumped in to rescue our thanks to TJ. We turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Have you ever wondered what you should do if you encounter a deadly animal, whether to run, hide, or just weep in sorrow? Environmental scientist and animal activist Mamadou Jai has the answers that you are looking for. Mamadou has racked up more than 14 million followers and nearly 800 million likes on TikTok for his distinctive takes on animal biology and behavior. Let's take a look. I went to Rutgers in New Jersey and majored in environmental science. Yes, my major had almost nothing to do with animals. I'm not really sure where the whole animal thing came from, but you remember zoo books? I had like 40 of these. As a kid, I was into spiders, snakes, and sharks, but for some reason, the only animal I was afraid of were pigeons, and I really can't tell you why. Still afraid of pigeons, Mamadou? I have a healthy respect for them. <laughs> so great to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. You're certainly well known for making videos about animal facts, focusing on why certain animals can be dangerous. What prompted you to research animals that could kill you? Uh, I, there was always an interest as a kid. I really couldn't tell you where it came from, but uh, I was always interested in the more unknown facts of nature. It's probably the ones, you, the facts that you wouldn't necessarily see in a documentary, just um, I like being able to see the entire picture, and it's not always pretty. It can be pretty brutal, but uh, uh, there's always been an interest, even when I was a kid. And throughout your research, there was an animal that on the surface looked terrifying, but in reality was, was the complete opposite? Uh, probably the shoebill stork. It's a, a really weird uh, answer, but if you Google it, you'll understand. It looks like a dinosaur that time forgot about. It, its eyes, <laughs> it looks like they are soulless. And I always had an aversion towards birds when I was really little. So seeing that kind of freaked me out. But they're actually pretty harmless. They're like a favorite for bird watchers in Africa. They're really tolerant of people and uh, not dangerous at all. So you also have a series where you debunk myths about animals. And we're going to play a quick game here with you where you address some of the common myths and set the record straight for all of us. Let's talk about dolphins first. A lot of people think dolphins are these sweet, cuddly creatures, and uh, they use that to juxtapose sharks, which are obviously violent killing machines, or at least that's what the media has told us for so long. They regularly bully sharks. They bully basically anything in the ocean that they can. And uh, yeah, they're not good. They're not evil. They're just dolphins, and they are very complex creatures. All right, how about penguins? Oh, wow. I'm not sure what I can say about penguins that I'm allowed to say on TV, but, uh, man, uh, the whole uh, cute and cuddly aspect of them, they can have um, some very interesting mating practices, especially Adelie penguins in Antarctica. They're the really feisty ones. Um, they're the ones known for kind of, like, being really uh, 
Man, they have some really uh, perverse uh, mating practices. Uh, there was actually a biologist that studied them a while back. And uh, what he discovered was so vile and disgusting that they actually took his studies, <laughs> refused to publish it. And we didn't, he, they didn't make it uh, available to the public until about 100 years later. And that's because everything he learned about them was just nothing you'd expect from a bird like that. All right, now I'm going to have to look it up. You've piqued my interest. All right, lastly, camels. Camels. Uh, again, healthy fear of camels. There's, they, are, they are basically built to survive any type of like harsh climate. Uh, they're seven feet tall. They can weigh uh, thousands of pounds. They have sharp um, toenails that can obviously uh, withstand the hot shifting desert sands, but it can also like break your ribs if it kicks you. Mm. They have, for a herbivore, they have really sharp canine teeth to be able to ha handle a uh, thorny shrubs and rough plants. But if, if one bites you, that's a part of you you're not getting back. Good descriptions there for all of us. It sounds like you have a healthy respect and, and fear of, of all things in the animal kingdom. But you've also written a book about the deadliest animals on Earth called 100 Animals That Can Effing End You. You list some pretty alarming facts about animals that can outrun the average human. Tell us which animals are on the list. Uh, hippos, that's one that surprises a lot of people. They look like these, uh, first of all, hippos aren't fat. They, they have a very uh, thin subcutaneous layer, but it's solid muscle underneath all of that. Uh, as fast as you think you are, there any hippo can outrun you. They can reach speeds of uh, uh, over 30 miles per hour. Uh, and that's like in land, in water, they can catch you when they want to. A motivated hippo is one of the scariest things on earth. Lastly, what do you hope that readers take away from your book? Oh, uh, that uh, th so they that they can understand the uh, full picture of nature. I mean, there's uh, obviously it can be romanticized a lot where you think that there's uh, always this happy ending, but it really isn't. Nature can be like brutal. It can be incredibly harsh, but it can also be very beautiful. And uh, there's just it's very complex. You have all these species that have learned how to like survive with each other over the course of millions of years. Uh, it's very interesting. And uh, obviously, they've also adapted ways to, ways to defend themselves, ways that uh, can probably end your ways. We certainly appreciate you, Mamadou. Thank you so much for joining our series TikTok this week. Mamadou's book, 100 Animals That Can Expletive End You, is now available as of July 5th. You can get it online. And before we go tonight, our image of the day, this portrait unveiled at the U.S. Capitol, it's of Hawaiian Representative Patsy Mink. In 1964, she was the first woman of color elected to Congress, and she was key in ensuring that what became known simply as Title IX was ultimately signed into law. As a matter of fact, when she passed away back in 2002, that law was renamed the Patsy Mink Equal Opportunity in Education Act. And that's our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, more on that blockbuster Supreme Court ruling on guns. We speak to a mayor of a major American city reeling from a recent mass shooting about his concerns about the repercussions that it might have. And, of course, more on the January 6th hearing and what we learn about the relentless pressure campaign against the DOJ. Stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. 
fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7 is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. So what's good to read this summer? Well, Kate and I have decided to jump in and help you. And we're talking with Oprah, John Irving, and so many popular authors and influencers. So we want you to join us. Myself, Charlie Gibson, and my daughter, Kate Gibson. Oh, hey, that's me. That is you. For the new podcast series, it is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen anywhere and anytime. The Bookcase Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm met today with oil refiners to discuss ways to try to bring down spiraling fuel prices. The meeting was a way for the White House to try and smooth over relations with industry executives. Earlier this week, the CEO of Chevron said President Biden was vilifying the industry. Biden responded by saying the CEO was, quote, mildly sensitive. A judge has given final approval to a settlement of more than $1 billion for victims of the collapse of that beachfront condominium in the Miami suburb of Surfside. 98 people died when the 12-story Champlain Tower South suddenly collapsed last year, one of the deadliest building failures in U.S. history. Most of the money will go to the people who lost family members in the disaster. The Uvalde School District has named an interim police chief to take over embattled Chief Pete Arredondo, who has been placed on administrative leave and criticized for his slow response to the shooting that left 19 children and two teachers dead. The head of the Texas Department of Public Safety said the police response to the shooting at Robb Elementary was an abject failure. Now to the explosive new revelations from the January 6th hearing about the relentless pressure campaign by President Trump toward the Department of Justice to find fraud in the election so that he could still stay in power. In one phone call, the former president reportedly told his acting attorney general, Jeff Rosen, to just say the election was corrupt and, quote, leave the rest to me. Here's our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Tonight, top officials in the Trump Justice Department described the immense pressure campaign Donald Trump put on them to use the power of their department to help overturn the presidential election. After Attorney General Bill Barr, who had told Trump there was no election fraud, resigned in December 2020, Trump put pressure on his replacement, Jeffrey Rosen, to do what Barr had refused to do. So between December 23rd and January 3rd, the president either called me or met with me virtually every day with one or two exceptions like Christmas Day. Trump relentlessly pushed Rosen and his deputy, Richard Donahue. The uh, president's entreaties became more urgent. He became more adamant that we weren't doing our job. We need to step up and do our job. Um, and he had this arsenal of allegations um, that he wanted to, um, to rely on. I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false. That is not true. Rosen at one point told Trump, quote, DOJ can't and won't snap its fingers and change the outcome of the election. How did the president respond to that, sir? He responded very quickly and said, essentially, uh, that's not what I'm asking you to do. What I'm just asking you to do is just say it was corrupt and leave the rest to me and the Republican congressman. The rise and fall of A number of Republican States members of Congress were actively promoting the president's lies. One of them, Scott Perry of Pennsylvania, pointed Trump to an obscure official in the Justice Department, Jeffrey Clark, who ran the department's environmental division. Clark drafted a letter for the Justice Department to send to the state of Georgia. This letter claims that the U.S. Department of Justice's investigations have, quote, identified significant concerns that may have impacted the outcome of the election in multiple states, including the state of Georgia. It was patently false. Top DOJ lawyers rejected it out of hand. It was so extreme to me, I had a hard time getting my head around it initially. I thought it was very important to give a prompt response rejecting this out of hand. On January 3rd, acting Attorney General Rosen found himself in the Oval Office with Clark, the president, and top Justice Department lawyers. Jeff Clark was proposing that uh, Jeff Rosen be replaced by Jeff Clark. And I thought the proposal was asinine. Witnesses told the committee, 
that Clark assured Trump that if he were in charge of the Justice Department, he would do what the president was demanding and find voter fraud. So I said, Mr. President, you're talking about putting a man in that seat who has never tried a criminal case, who has never conducted a criminal investigation. It's impossible. It's absurd. It's not going to happen, and it's going to fail. Then Trump asked this question. He said, so suppose I do this. So suppose I replace him, Jeff Rosen, with him, Jeff Clark. What would you do? And I said, Mr. President, I would resign immediately. I'm not working one minute for this guy. You're going to lose your entire department leadership. Every single AAG will walk out on you, and Jeff Clark will be left leading a graveyard. Ultimately, the threat of mass resignations worked. The president decided not to name Jeff Clark the acting attorney general. Trump's pressure campaign on the Justice Department did not let up. After the horror of January 6th, a number of Republican members of Congress who had been pushing Trump's lies... There's widespread evidence of fraud. We are going to object to electors from states that didn't run clean elections. ...asked the White House for pardons. And was Representative Gates requesting a pardon? Believe so. The, the general tone was, we may get prosecuted because we were defensive of, you know, the president's positions on these things. The pardon that he was discussing, requesting, was as broad as you could describe from the beginning, I remember he's from the beginning of time up until today, for any and all things. He mentioned Nixon, and I said Nixon's pardon was never nearly that broad. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. Now to the Supreme Court ruling that could expand gun rights in this country and alter existing laws on the books in states where one in four Americans live. The six to three decision strikes down New York State's 110 year old law that required gun owners a proper cause in order to carry a concealed handgun in public for self defense. Justice Clarence Thomas wrote citizens shouldn't have to explain to the government why they're seeking to exercise a constitutional right. So what does the ruling mean where you live and what happens next? Here's ABC's Terry Moran. For more than a century, New York State has had one of the nation's strictest laws regulating the concealed carrying of firearms. But today, the Supreme Court struck that law down. The New York law required anyone seeking a license to carry a concealed handgun to show they had proper cause, a special need for it. But by a 6-3 to three majority, the court today declared that law violates the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Justice Clarence Thomas writing for the court, we know of no other constitutional right that an individual may exercise only after demonstrating to government officers some special need. It is not how the Second Amendment works when it comes to public carry for self-defense. The New York law Thomas wrote for the court's six conservative justices gave local officials too much discretion over a constitutional right. Why isn't it good enough to say I live in a violent area and um, I want to be able to defend myself? Now New York must revise the 109-year-old law in accordance, Thomas wrote, with this nation's historical traditions of firearms regulation. Today, the governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, swift in her reaction. This decision isn't just reckless, it's reprehensible. It's not what New Yorkers want. And we should have the right of determination of what we want to do in terms of our gun laws in our state. President Biden, in a statement, said the ruling should deeply trouble us all, adding, in the wake of the horrific attacks in Buffalo and Uvalde, we must do more as a society, not less, to protect our fellow Americans. I think it's a bad decision. I think it's... And I think it's not reasoned accurately, but I'm disappointed. In his dissent, Justice Stephen Breyer mentioned the nearly 300 mass shootings that have occurred this year, saying the court's decision does not consider the potentially deadly consequences and that it burdens states' efforts in preventing gun violence and protecting the safety of its citizens. But Justice Samuel Alito firing back, writing, how does the dissent account for the fact that one of the mass shootings near the top of its list took place in Buffalo? The New York law at issue in this case obviously did not stop that perpetrator. The head of a gun rights group that brought the case saying he's relieved. We are not the problem. The problem is the criminals and the wrongdoers in the state. And the politicians have to learn that. 
The decision is also being hailed as a landmark win for the NRA. 80 million Americans live in states with laws similar to New York's, and it remains to be seen how those laws might change. Under this opinion, those laws are also likely unconstitutional. And so all of those states are now going to have to go back to the drawing board and pass new laws, you know, regulating the ability to carry guns outside of the home. Our thanks to Terry Moran. The Supreme Court's ruling is drawing mixed reaction today with cheers from Second Amendment advocates and concerns from those worried about more guns on the streets. So I went out and spoke with people here in New York City who could feel the impact most directly. Within minutes of that Supreme Court decision striking down New York's concealed carry law, New York City's Mayor Eric Adams immediately condemned it. This decision has made every single one of us less safe from gun violence. There is no place in the nation that is going to be impacted based on this decision more than New York City. Home to more than 8 million residents, New York City is the most populated city in the U.S. And despite some of the strictest gun laws in the country, gun arrests are at a 28-year high following a spike in shootings. So far this year, the NYPD has already taken more than 3,000 illegal guns off the streets. But tonight, the mayor warns the new ruling will put more guns on the streets and put New Yorkers in more danger. We're a densely populated city. Uh, millions of people use our transportation system. Traffic accidents uh, can es escalate into gunfights. That's not what we want. And we cannot allow New York to become the wild, wild west. Tonight, people in New York City are reacting. The Second Amendment does support the right to bear arms. That being said, that is not working in our world today. We definitely need change. And I think New York had a reasonable constraint that most people seem to support. And, and so, now you feel less safe? Less I, I, safe. I will, I think, when, when I feel like people are running around carrying guns and there are more guns on the streets, yeah. We are joined now by Buffalo, New York, Mayor Byron Brown. Thank you so much, Mayor, for your time tonight. Uh, New York Governor Kathy Hochul responded to today's Supreme Court ruling, saying, quote, this decision isn't just reckless, it's reprehensible. First, I'd like to just get your reaction to the decision by the court. I just concluded a, a meeting with the governor and mayors across the state of New York. Uh, I was very disappointed by the action of the Supreme Court in uh, their decision on the concealed carry permit law in the state of New York. Um, uh, the court uh, essentially eliminating uh, uh, an individual giving justification for why they need to conceal carry a, a weapon. You and I spoke several times in the wake of the mass shooting at the Topps grocery store in your city. Uh, that was carried out using an assault weapon. We, but talk about the everyday toll of gun violence that you see in your city from people carrying handguns and, and how you think that this ruling could impact that. Uh, there, there is a toll of people carrying handguns in the city of Buffalo. Four police officers witnessed a murder on the street with a handgun in broad daylight. Uh, police pursued that individual who then shot at police officers. Mm. Uh, police had to return fire, uh, wounding that individual and taking them into custody. But this is the kind of thing that um, uh, we see in communities all across this country. Uh, there are too many guns on the streets and certainly too many illegal weapons uh, that result from weapons that at one point were legal. And now, you did just outline and highlight one particular incident there, but do you see a specific danger with the potential for more concealed weapons being carried legally on the streets of Buffalo in the wake of this ruling? I do see a danger. I do see a concern for law enforcement. Uh, they will not know uh, who is legally permitted to carry a weapon uh, if there are more weapons being carried uh, in a concealed fashion. Uh, in the city of Buffalo, uh, across the state of New York and other communities across the country. It will make the job of law enforcement a lot more difficult. And you've called for sensible gun reforms in the wake of the rise in gun violence in this country. But how will this ruling in particular impact the ability of cities and states to put restrictions on guns? What, what do you see as the path forward? For this ruling uh, to come down uh, today, 
as sensible gun reform is moving through the Congress, uh, it certainly has a chilling effect. Uh, and for those uh, families who have had family members victimized by gun violence, uh, this also has a further traumatizing effect. And what do you say, though, to conservatives like New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, who, who calls this a, quote, win for law-abiding gun owners and who says that this merely protects the Second Amendment right to bear arms? Uh, I say that Congresswoman uh, Stefanik is, is absolutely wrong. Uh, she's completely out of touch uh, with what is happening in um, communities all across this country, uh, in her own city. Uh, New York City, in her own state, New York State, uh, far too many innocent Americans are losing their lives to gun violence. Uh, we don't want to take away the rights of responsible gun owners. We certainly uh, do not want to uh, infringe on the Second Amendment. Uh, but it does make sense for there to be sensible gun reform uh, that does not in, uh, fringe on the rights of responsible gun owners and at the same time uh, keeps average innocent Americans safe from uh, unnecessary gun violence. You know, one quick qu last question for you, Mayor. Uh, today I was speaking to someone who said that she feels that it's time for the Second uh, the Amendment to be amended. Uh, do you agree that that might be something that should be considered? You know, I, I think uh, there are people that perhaps feel that way. Uh, I, I don't know how that would ever happen when we can't even um, move forward sensible gun reform. Right. So to talk about amending the second gun, uh, the second, um, the second amendment, uh, when we can't even get Congress to move on sensible gun reform, uh, I, I think is unrealistic. And it took uh, tragedies like the mass shooting the act of domestic terror that took place in Buffalo on May 14th and other mass shootings since that time to finally get Congress to take some action. And on, uh, on the day when we are seeing further movement in Congress on sens sensible gun reform, this ruling comes down from the United States Supreme Court. Uh, it is a disappointment and it is a dark day for sensible gun reform in this nation. Buffalo Mayor Byron Brown, we thank you so much for your time. Appreciate your insight. Thank you, Lindsay. And still to come, the fallout after that deadly earthquake in Afghanistan and a new series that depicts the immigrant struggle in a comical way. We're joined by the show's creator and one of its stars. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live.
Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Search and rescue staff help villagers in Afghanistan move the injured out of the quake zone and provide relief supplies to the many who have been left homeless. The 6.1 magnitude quake on Wednesday has left more than 1,500 injured, and authorities were bracing for casualty numbers to grow as information trickles in from remote mountain villages. Wednesday's quake was the deadliest in Afghanistan since 2002. Despite previous health care hiccups, Pope Francis is still visiting Canada next week. The Vatican announced his schedule, which includes visits to two Canadian cities and two meetings with indigenous groups. Eight people who took care of soccer legend Diego Maradona will be tried in Argentina courts for homicide, according to a ruling released today, following an investigation into his November 22 death due to cardiac arrest. In the 236-page document seen by Reuters, the judge in charge of the case questioned the behaviors active or omission of each of the accused, which led to and contributed Contributed to the realization of the harmful result. There is no set trial for the no set date for the trial. Now we bring you one show that is depicting the realities of the immigrant struggle in a rather comical way. Gordita Chronicles follows the story of a Dominican family that migrated over to Miami longing for the American dream, but when they arrive, everything is not what it seems. Always be home for us. But only for a few more days because we are soon gonna have a gorgeous new home in Miami. <laughs> die or run away. The song said America the Beautiful. I think they oversold it. Girls, give America a chance. What do you say? Uh, <laughs> joining us now is actress Olivia Gonzalez and show creator Claudia Forestieri. Let's start with the title of the series, Gordita Chronicles. You know, Gordita obviously means chubby, and mm -hmm. for many Latinos, it's kind of a term of endearment, but it has a little bit of a different meaning connotation sometimes here in the United States for English speakers. What, explain the nuance of the name and, and also why you decided to name the show Gordita Chronicles. Sure, so Gordita, as you said, means chubby. And um, for Latinos, it's used as a, term, as a term of endearment sometimes, but it also depends on the tone, because oh. they could be like, come here, gordita, but sometimes they'll, they could tell you like, oh, you're getting gordita, uh, and then, yeah. so, but in the United States, when you translate it, like, you can't just call anybody on the street, like, chubby, like, oh, come here, little chubby, <laughs> like, you'll get smacked on the head. So that was part of, like, my uh, learning curve when I came to the United States, is knowing, like, even when you translate it, it doesn't quite mean the same thing. And you, Olivia, play Cuckoo, who's kind of a, a witty, uh, we saw a little bit of the, the sass in, in your character. And this is one of your first time, first times ever acting. Yes. What, what attracted you to this role? And, and do you find that, that Olivia and Cuckoo are very different, or do you guys have a little bit in common? Well, what attracted me to this role is that I was a young, 12, chubby, Dominican year old immigrant and I am Dominican. I am 12 years old and I also am on the chubby side. <laughs> so that's what attracted me. And I feel like me and Gugu are very similar because we're, like I said, both chubby, both 12 years old, both Dominican. We're n I'm not an immigrant, but um, I don't know. You I love playing it? Yeah. The role? Because it's so much like my like myself, so it's like I'm living my normal life. It's scripted. <laughs> oh, that's fun. <laughs> and, and Claudia, I'm curious because the Migrant Policy Institute um, actually says that 60 percent of Dominicans who migrate to the United States live in New York or New Jersey. So why did you decide to actually have this in Miami? Because that's where I grew up, and mm. that's the experience that I knew. And being Dominican in Miami was like being a minority inside of a minority. When we moved there in the 80s, my dad worked for an airline, like the fictional father, Victor. And, um, you know, there was the Cuban community that was growing. And then inside the Cuban community were us as Dominicans. So in some ways, it was double hard being like Dominican in Miami. But now, actually, uh, Miami has a big Dominican neighborhood called Alapata. So we don't have as many as in New York, but there are Dominicans in Miami too. Alex Rodriguez is a famous oh. one who was there. And there's probably some other ones that I can't recall right now. But um, I think Oscar de la Renta had a house there too. 
And, and the show also kind of highlights some of the microaggressions experienced by immigrants. In episode two, uh, we see Cuckoo having a little bit of difficulty uh, speaking Spanish in class. Let's play a clip. Okay, the Bill of Rights contains the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, the right that los americanos must get in, <laughs> like freedom of speech, uh, the right to the city lo que quieras, and not get thrown in la cárcel. Uh, Cuckoo, I'm gonna stop you. This is an English-only class, and that's because... America, we speak English. Very good. Forced assimilation is, is often uh, commonly experienced by immigrants. How did you prepare for, for that particular part, this role in general? Well, to prepare myself for this role, I just took advice from my mom, my aunt, and my manager. Perfect. Was to just be myself, and that's what I did on all my auditions while playing the role. And being Dominican, it's not hard to play a Dominican in a TV show, so <laughs> everything was like, it worked perfectly together. You just get to be yourself. Yeah. And, and Claudia, so in the same episode, you have Eduardo, who's a custodian, who talks about how he used to be a doctor when he was in Nicaragua. Why was that important for you to talk about that? Because one of the reasons I wanted, I created this show is because I felt there wasn't a show that um, demonstrated the immigrant experiences that I grew up around um, in Miami. And um, part of, uh, a lot of the people that were in Miami, whether they came from Nicaragua or Cuba, had these other past lives. And um, they were very brave people that came and started over. So just because someone is emptying out your trash doesn't mean that 10 years ago they weren't in the operating room back sure. in their native country. That's part of the immigrant experience. You know, sometimes you gotta take a little step back to move forward. And Olivia, with all your success now, what's next for you? I mean, this was just one of your first acting gigs. Do you wanna continue doing this? Um, yeah, it's been a really fun experience. I hope if I have any more experiences like this, it goes the same because Nothing was out of place. I feel like it was just a nice, smooth road. Mm. No bumps at all. Everything was great. The amazing cast. This beautiful woman right here, <laughs> who I play as young as her younger self. And I'm just glad I, I chose this job. I'm glad that you chose it as well. We look thank forward you. to watching. Olivia, Claudia, we thank you so much for joining us today. You can stream Gordita Chronicles on HBO Max today. And still to come, the landmark legislation that impacted so many women's lives. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And we have a winner. This bloodhound named Trumpet became the first of his breed to take the coveted Westminster Kennel Club dog show. With a perfect stride, Trumpet beat a French bulldog, a German shepherd, and others. After his victory, Trumpet posed patiently for countless photos like the champ that he is.
Now to the celebration of Title IX, the game-changing legislation that laid the groundwork for women's sports in schools. Our Becky Worley, a fierce college soccer and rugby player, is back with what Title IX meant when it was signed into law 50 years ago today. NCAA Eastern Regional Hope Finals. 50 years ago, sports in schools and colleges looked like this. But in 1972, a politician from my hometown in Hawaii helped change that. Women's rights are about fundamental justice. Patsy Mink of Hawaii, the first woman of color elected to Congress, co-wrote and sponsored the Title IX legislation. Those 37 words started a slow march to where we are today. It really was intended to be a broad piece of legislation that prohibited sex discrimination in education. And it wasn't until a few years later when the Department of Education was issuing regulations that sports became an issue because people realized prohibiting sex discrimination in education included school-sponsored sports. While equity in sports still isn't perfect, we've come a long way, baby. Title IX opened the doors for girls to play sports, and they came rushing through. Today, women make up 44% of all NCAA athletes, compared to 15% before Title IX. College is that next step for a lot of girls and women to be able to get a scholarship to play sports in college, also get a college education, and kind of kickstart a possible professional career. Without Title IX, I know for sure, like, I would not be where I am today. Softball legend Kat Osterman says growing up in Texas, a next-door neighbor who happened to be on the local school board took notice of the future Olympian practicing for hours in the family driveway. He approached my dad and said, hey, I think we have a Title IX issue. All the high schools have baseball fields, but very few of them have softball fields. And he made a push to get every high school its own softball fields. So by the time I started high school, I had a home field at my own high school that wasn't going to be there originally. But beyond the court or the field, this legislation has had a major impact on society. The majority of U.S. medical students today are women. Same with law schools. And while the STEM fields are catching up, the athletes that have pursued those fields are out of this world. Like former USA rugby star and Division I softball player Anne McLean. My mom wanted to be an astronaut too, and she was just born at the wrong time. But she got to see what I could do when things like Title IX are in place and they give opportunities. McLean is a member of Artemis, an elite team of astronauts selected for NASA's Return to the Moon program. So one of the things that we look for when we select astronauts are people that know how to work and function in a team. And one of the great ways that you can prove those skills is through athletics. And I think no matter what your profession is, sports is such a good way to set yourself up to be a team player. And CEOs follow the same pattern. One poll says that over 90% of women in the C-suite played sports. From the boardroom to the court. This nomination is confirmed. All right. And of course, that other court. These Wonder Women are a testament to the broad, enduring impact of Title IX's mere 37 words. Girls continue to break barriers today. Sarah Fuller has become the first woman to score a point in a Power Five college football game. The battle cry for basic equality continues. Equal pay! Equal pay! This is our weight room. Let me show you all the men's weight room. I think Title IX has helped me realize that I do need to continue to carry the torch because there are inequalities that I've faced in my lifetime and still face today. I think the key is that we continue to push forward so the younger generations aren't fighting the same battles that we're fighting. 50 years strong. Our thanks to Becky Worley for that. That's our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. America's number one news 